right, looks like folks are finding their way in. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, I will hand it over to Vasiliki to introduce our speaker or speakers. Yeah, we will speak us. Yes, and thank you so much for organizing this event. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I'm Vasiliki Vita, um, and I'm here to introduce um, uh, Professor Julia Salabank, uh, who is a professor of revitalization and policy at SOAS University of London, um, along with um, three of her students. Um, Julia is uh, our supervisor, the supervisor of uh, our PhD projects. Um, so we have um, Nahida Ahmed, um, Miho Zlazli, and myself. And now I'm going to start sharing my screens. We can, we thought we might do it. Um, we might do our introductions uh, more interactively and kind of mm -hmm. uh, uh, all of us uh, share our experiences. So we have indigenous, external, and hybrid researchers. Uh, so we will be comparing and contrasting our experiences uh, in. Uh, uh, doing language revitalization work. Um, can you all see my screen? Okay, that's great. Um, okay, so I guess let's start with uh, with introductions. Uh, Julia, um, if you would uh, like to to start to talk to us a little bit about your background and your motivation in doing uh, language revitalization work. Yeah, hi, thank you very much. Yes. Um, yeah, I can't remember a time when I've really not been interested in languages and language revitalization. Um, one of my early memories is going on holiday to Wales when I was about nine and spending all the holiday making a bilingual dictionary. And I made a new one every night for my parents with new words that I collected. They must have gone absolutely mad <laughs> in, in red and blue as well. OK. Um, and one reason I'm interested in language is um, because um, although I was born in the UK, um, my mother comes from Guernsey in the Channel Islands, um, and my father spent some of his formative years there, and that's where they met um, and emigrated to the UK um, in order to uh, in order to find work after the Second World War. Um, which is a whole actually a part of the the story in Guernsey because uh, Guernsey was um, occupied by the Germans, the only part of the British Isles to be occupied by the Germans in the Second World War. And that is often blamed for the loss of the language because about uh, over a half of the population, including most of the children were evacuated to the UK during the war, including my mother. And many of them lost the language at that time. Um, it's interesting um, because people blame that a lot. The people in Guernsey don't, many of them don't know that there are other, other, lang other endangered languages, thousands of them around the world. They thought they were going through this on their own, the, the whole kind of tragedy of language loss. Um, anyway, I've always been fascinated with the local language. Um, my family didn't speak it. My mother, when I, when I told my, my, my mother I wanted to study it, she said, oh, it was holding us back, you know. And there was this, this is part of the attitude. And this sort of um, um, odd kind of um, affectionate but disparaging uh, negative attitudes as well towards the language. So it was something that people were attached to, but also something that they felt was not very useful. And this useful word was a sort of part of the post Second World War sort of modernist um, ideology that there was in, in, in the island. So Nowadays, um, we really think there are probably under a hundred fluent speakers of Jean um, <clears throat> um And when I, I am probably now the youngest female flu, uh, proficient speaker, which um, is sort of slightly worrying since I'm 61. Um, so we have quite a lot of work to do in terms of language revitalization. Um, I don't see it, I, I, I'm, as I said, I see myself as an islander. I, we, we visited the island every year. Um, when I was young, I kind of was brought up to think of myself as from Guernsey, but not everyone on the island, uh, particularly not the language speakers, or didn't originally think, see of me. They saw me as an outsider. And I think this is also an issue for people who have gone 
abroad or gone to a big city to become educated and they want to go back and they're interested in their heritage. And I think this is an issue for quite a few of us involved in endangered language research, but really in many, in many places it's, it's the third or even fourth generation who get interested in, in language revitalization. Those who's, who didn't, the parents that didn't have it and so the parents couldn't pass it on to us. Um, and now we feel this loss, we feel this kind of need to, to, to try to reclaim something which we didn't have the chance to, to have when we were young. Um, so back in 2000, when uh, I, I did an MA in uh, Applied Linguistics, and um, I really enjoyed doing my dissertation. I thought, I want to do more. I want to do a PhD. Um, but I've done my dissertation topic. I want to do something else. And this is my chance to study my heritage language. Um, um, and so this, you know, this is 21 years ago. So I, I've, I've first of all looked at attitudes. Um, and but I did a lot of, of participant observation in language revitalization activities. And at first, I didn't want to criticize anyone involved in language revitalization because they get enough uh, um, criticism from people who don't want to save the language. But then I realized that things weren't working. And I thought, and, and also I have, because I am an academic and I have access to academic literature, I can read journals, I could talk to people from other places, and I could see things that working in some places that might work in our area and um, with our language. And this is a, an advantage of having these academic links that not everyone has has either the language to access or the all the um, subscriptions to academic journals, which are very expensive, of course. Um, and as I mentioned, when I started, people didn't even know there were other endangered languages, let alone know what was going on there. Um, so I felt it was it was important for me to speak up about things that, that, that I was noticing. And the major challenges I was finding were things like um, a lack of clear aims in language revitalization, um, a lack of what we call ideological clarification that Joshua Fishman talked about. So what do we, what do we want? Why, how are we going to get there? Um, what, are, what are our aims? What are our strategies? Um, and kind of connected to that uh, uh, community dynamics, people who have vested interests, people have particular interests, um, particular points of view, and some quite strong personalities who are kind of opposed to other people. I know they're all related, which also doesn't help. So often people have this backward looking view of it used to be our language and now it isn't anymore and they don't have a, 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 a fact, you know, as I would consider myself as what we call a new speaker, and Miho is going to talk about new speakers um later as well um and really that's what revitalization needs is people who haven't spoken the language who want to reclaim the language maybe like me we heard it when they were young maybe from grandparents or in the community um i get flashbacks of things like sunday school picnics when when i hear certain words um but people don't um, or the older speakers don't even have a concept of the possibility of anyone wanting to learn the language um, especially not from outside as they see it. Um, so people, some people, not that I'm that good, but, um, but people don't even kind of recognize that I, I'm not a native speaker because they, they don't recognize the possibility of, of second language or new speakers. And this, this is also a problem for anyone who wants to learn the language. Um, yeah. Um, and finally, politically, there's a lot of inertia. Um, Genesia was eventually recognized only last year, only last August, did the island government um, a vote to recognize the language, but so far nothing has been done concretely. They keep saying they're going to start a language commission, but we, there's no actual action so far, which would help some of the language activists um, with, with both moral and, 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 and financial support, which is very useful. Okay, yeah. that's enough from me. Um, we're going to kind of introduce ourselves and then kind of have a conversation about comparisons and contrasts. Exactly. Yeah. So um, a lot of the of the topics, the challenges you mentioned, I feel yeah. um, are quite relevant and similar to many projects. Um, Nahida, would you would you like to go next? Um, sure. What a, what about your background and motivations in doing revitalization work? Hi, uh, so I'm Nahida. I'm originally from northern Pakistan, from Gilgit, and I speak Wahi as my mother tongue. 
Um, so just on the map, can you see the dark gray region? That's where all the Waki speakers reside. So if you look closely, you can see that it's uh, spoken by people who um, are at the borders of four countries. So here's Tajikistan, the small bit in the middle is Afghanistan. Then this here is Pakistan. And of course you can see China here and some parts of Xinjiang is where the language is spoken. So um, <clears throat> um, the problem now is that Waki is a minority language in a very small mountainous region in Pakistan. And it is true of Waki in all of the other countries as well. So beginning with Pakistan, I just want to mention that um, the village I am from is bilingual. We have Burushiski speakers as well as Waki in our village. And for our education purposes, my parents moved to Gilgit, which is a town. And there we learned English and Urdu at school. And um, the Gilgit region, like I said, it's not very big, not very populous, but the main language that is spoken there is Shina. So you can already see that it's uh, very multilingual. <clears throat> Um, like I mentioned, um, this situation is true of Waki speakers in all of the other countries as well. So Xinjiang is the biggest province in China, but Wakis are um, a subgroup of the Pamiri Tajiks who live there. And Sarikoli, um, Uyghur and Mandarin are some of the languages that the Waki speakers in China speak. In Tajikistan, Waki speakers live um, with uh, Shugni speakers who are actually um, the closest to, to the language in the language tree. Um, so I think uh, it's not completely mutually intelligible, but there are similarities, some words, vocabulary. Um, and in, um, in Afghanistan, um, people speak uh, Waki and they speak Dari. And if they have communication with people outside of the Pami region, the Wakhan region, then they also learn Pashto because that is also one of the biggest languages spoken in Afghanistan. Um, how I uh, became interested in, in languages is um, I came to the United Kingdom in 2014 on a, on a program um, to do graduate program in Islamic studies and humanities it is called and the first two years we study Islamic studies and in the third we can do a master's of our choice in in the UK at, at any university. I saw that SOAS offered a degree in language documentation and description so I signed up and I, I loved um, my time um, doing my MA at SOAS but I thought it was it went by too quickly. So, uh, um, I mean, I learned a lot about how to work with a field work for endangered languages and all of the other languages and how people have worked indigenous languages outside as researchers. So I thought um, my research, of course, was on Waki for my MA and I thought I need to take it forward and uh, expand it in my, um, in my PhD research studies. Um, so uh, for my research, um, for my PhD research, my participants are actually Waki speakers who have moved from Tajikistan to Russia. Um, as you might know, um, Tajikistan was part of the Soviet Union and um, the languages that are spoken there, um, like one of the official language used to be Russia and it still is one of the official languages of the country. And because of the Soviet Union, they wrote Tajiki in the Cyrillic script as well. So the script is another, another story, as you can um, imagine, because these are minority indigenous people living in border areas. And uh, the main country, the main language, the written and spoken language of the countries are completely different. And there is no chance, no occasion for people to, to interact with each other, to see each other. Um, I mean, my grandparents spoke of people they knew in Wakhan, but I have no idea, I have no way of either remembering them or a way of getting to know them. So doesn't have an orthography, Waki doesn't have an orthography. So people in each of these countries write it in the script they know. 
So that is the, the situation with the, with the language at the moment. And like I said, my um, research participants are now living in diaspora. They have moved from Tajikistan to two different cities in Russia to find work. And they had, they had to learn the, the dominant language so that you know, they could get their degrees, they could find work. And now they are living there. And um, the challenges that present themselves to these families, to people, some of them have gone there as individuals. They are still studying or have just finished and they're working or supporting their people, their families back in Tajikistan. So um, I uh, am looking at how the sociolinguistic factors are presenting themselves to the people who live in, in Russia. So how was education a factor? How was finding work? How was living in Russia without being able to speak, working on a daily basis, a problem or a challenge, or did they even think about it? So this is my research um, and my interest. Um, um, because of COVID, I had to <laughs> change my um, data collection online. So that took a bit of time. And um, very interesting things. I mean, when I speak to my participants, although I am an insider, an insider because of the fact that I speak Wahi, but it, there are times when I don't understand my participants and they don't understand me. And we try to communicate and they might know some words that they, us they usually use in their day-to-day um, -day lives that are Russian, that are unfamiliar to me. So sometimes we have to send each other texts and then Google Translate to understand what's being said. Or they send me messages in um, Russian and I translate. <laughs> so yeah, uh, so I am an insider as well as an outsider, of course. And um, our communication is basically via different technological mediums. And um, the time difference is also one of the issues and people have work. So um, to, to organize all of that has been a problem. But um, I mean, besides that, um, revitalization, I mean, I can see them um, being really proud of, of their language and their culture and um, the activities that they organize or the way they speak about their language. Um, I, I cannot make a generalization right now, but from, from whatever I have gathered so far, um, it seems that they want to pass it on to their, their younger generations. But again, because they are not in the, in the nexus, in their home countries or the language emerged and they have to speak in at least one very dominant language, um, which is Russian at the present. So we will see how it goes. Um, I just wanted to uh, share some uh, snapshots from one of the videos that they um, that they um, yeah uploaded on on YouTube for their New Year celebration for Navruz. Um, if you see all the all the people in this picture are. Um, dressed in their Tajik attire, and they have the traditional um, drums and the basket. And if we can move to the next um, photo, please, Ms. Siliki. So here, this woman is actually making um, wool, and like you make it into spools using some traditional wooden tools. I was really impressed when I saw this because as a person who has seen this in Pakistan, I wouldn't be able to do this. And these kind of activities are now lost in Pakistan. My grandmother did this, which is why I have seen it being done, but I haven't done it myself. So for young people in, you know, and adults in Russia who have come from Tajikistan to, to do this is quite impressive. And it's not that they do this for a living and they, they just wanted to showcase the things that they did. So um, it, it shows that they want to preserve their cultural activities. They want to show their next generations what's going on. 
So yes, um, I mean, let's see how far they can, uh, and hopefully <laughs> they, can, they can maintain it and teach it to their, their um, next generations. Um, this is um, a traditional baby pram. So it's made of wood and the babies then secured into this and it can rock to and fro to put the baby to sleep. So they have also displayed this at their New Year celebration, which is really, really amazing. Um, yes. Um, yeah, so this is um, sort of the, the work that I am doing presently. And if you have any more questions, of course, we can talk about it as the, as the talk proceeds today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then uh, next, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Miho, and then I'll go last. Um, Miho, uh, what about you, uh, your background and your motivation in doing language revitalization work? Oh, thank you. Um, I'm originally from Okinawa Island in the Ryukyu Islands. It locates in southwest part of Japan. And we have uh, uh, around 50 inhabited islands across 800 kilometers. And we have, um, our population is really large, 1.5 million people, but um, we have 50 islands, a small islands which uh, ha have only 10 or 20 people and the largest uh, part of more than 300,000 people. And I'm from, uh, I'm from, political center uh, uh, of Ryukyu Island, uh, which, which has been political center since we, since we were still a kingdom before annexed to Japan. Um, my motivation to do language revitalization work is, um, I have suffered from a strong emotional insecurity since I was very young, but I didn't know why. And, but when I learned the history of our people and as my PhD research progressed, I became less anxious. I think I'm involved in language revitalization work to reclaim my own identity. I was brought up in, um, uh, I, am an, uh, I am originally from Ryukyu, but my mother's size family, um, they were educators and politicians who supported the Japanese government who, who practiced aggressive assimilation policy. My father's size family, they were all fluent in Ryukyu one languages, but um, my mother was the center of my family's uh, language planning. So I, uh, Although my father and his family are all fluent in Ryukyu one languages and they were talk, talking to each other in Ryukyu one, but I had very strong negative attitude towards my own ancestral language. So I didn't speak um, Ryukyu one languages, a language at all. Then uh, I happened to move to England 10 years ago when I married my husband. And when my son got older, I thought maybe I wanted to get trained as a Japanese language teacher. So I enrolled on um, master's degree at SOAS to become a, a Japanese language teacher. Then I met people who work on endangered languages. <laughs> then, then there are also many Japanese language learners. Then they asked me, are you from Tokyo? Then I said, no, 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 I'm from Okinawa. Then they said, oh, then you do you speak Ryukyu one languages as well? Then I was surprised because I, until that moment, I totally forgot about the existence of my own ancestral language. Then I was keen to learn English or Chinese or Arabic or other languages, but I totally forgot about my own language. Then by the time I <laughs> finished my master's degree, I started to think maybe I will use what I learned. Um, I, I learned language teaching. And I thought maybe I should use this to, to, to teach Ryukyu one languages 
instead. Then I decided to continue the PhD degree. Then, then um, Julia is my supervisor now. Then what I am doing now is um, I'm trying to recruit new speakers of Ryukyuan languages. I myself is also the new speaker of Ryukyuan languages, a uh, language, and I try to promote master apprentice, apprentice language learning initiative across Ryukyu. Is it better to speak about this now or later? Maybe I. Would. No, oh, okay. go ahead. I, th I think ah, okay. it, it's nice. You started nicely, so it, fit, it fits very well here, I think. Okay. Then what we do is, uh, this is not my own activity. Due to the COVID pandemic, I'm also grounded in London. I can't travel to London or to the UK Island, so I borrowed these pictures from one new speaker's organization called Okinawa Hands-On NPO. What they do is they often organize events like this. This one was uh, cooking, cooking sessions with traditional speaker. Then they were learning how to use local ingredients to cook traditional um, snacks. Then, then they learned this course for several months. Then they also um, broadcast their sessions online. So I attended the session um, via Zoom. Then what are this lady in pink, uh, pink clothes? In the beginning, she, uh, a new speaker was speaking to her in Ryukyuan language, but she was replying to them in Japanese consistently because she had, um, she was really ashamed of her own language because when she was young, she was, uh, forbidden to use her own language at school. But um, after three months, I noticed that she was, she gradually started speaking Ryukyuan language. And then then uh, people who are attending this session, um, there were people, young people who was using Ryukyuan language at, languages at home. Some participants, participants were like me, they had negative attitudes or some people just uh, simply didn't have chance to be exposed to Ryukyuan languages. But uh, in this session, normally endangered languages are not heard in daily, uh, daily life setting, but in this uh, creative space, new speakers are um, actively using Ryukyuan language, language. So just by attending this space, we could hear Ryukyuan language spoken. So we learn new, new phrases without doing any effort. It was really nice. Even I learned a lot of expression from their sessions. So they run a safe, creative space full of surprise with traditional speakers. And new speakers are encouraged to use our traditional languages. And traditional speakers, they had, um, they felt healing, it has healing effect on traditional speakers. So they, in the beginning, they were lusty speakers, but at the end, they became more fluent. So the experience was really nice. Then we also um, noticed that this place was not only for learning traditional knowledge or language, but also reconnecting fragmented relationships. Then, people who didn't have chance to be exposed to Ryukyuan languages, they, they, their attachment grew through the sessions. Then they also started to have emergent self-identity as Ryukyuan people. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a very interesting. It sounds really fun. Um, uh, and, and also I wanted to add one more. Um, mm -hmm. We have another um, indigenous language called Ainu. Then Ainu people, uh, I thought uh, until I met Ainu new speaker, I thought Ainu language was almost um, extinct kind of, but actually as, as us, we, we have a lot of new speakers in 20s and 30s, so we have hope. Then Ainu, there are uh, new speakers of Ainu languages also increasing. 
Then we were recently we started um, um, socializing together. So we have really strong hope now. Thank you. Thank you. That that sounds awesome. Um, well, um, I'm going to talk about uh, myself too, although I'm um, I'm an external researcher. So, um, well, my background is I, I'm born and raised in Greece. Um, I really have, um, um, I mean, my connections to Palau come primarily from my previous partner. I, I actually didn't even know that this country um, existed. <laughs> um, so I studied in I studied English in Greece, um, and I majored in applied linguistics. So basically, teaching English. Um, I am a professional teacher of of English. I've been teaching for the past almost uh, four years now. Um, and then uh, I I did a semester abroad at University of uh, Brighton uh, while I was doing my bachelor's, and uh, that's when um, I discovered. Um, other ways applied linguists could be useful. <laughs> and that, that was language documentation description. So when I looked at uh, programs, uh, master's programs in, in Europe, I found the one at SOAS. So um, Nahida, it's nice to, to also meet an alumni of the, of the program. Um, and then, uh, while I was uh, I was doing that program, my master's project um, was um, an analysis of um, uh, video and audio files found uh, on an ELAR collection. Um, so this is how I I first uh, got in touch with the speakers of uh, uh, Tobian and Sonsorolis in Palau. I I emailed the curators of the collection and then. Uh, they brought me in touch with the speakers, and we worked together on uh, my master's dissertation. So Palau is a, is a small island uh, nation in the um, uh, northwest Pacific, near Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and the Philippines. Um, it has um, two, ofi two official languages. Uh, English and Palawan, with Palawan being a nas the national language. And then there are other um, languages which are official in their respective states. So for example, in Angaur, uh, Japanese is also um, an official language um, as a remnant of the of uh, Japanese coloni colonization during, I think, uh, World War I. Um, if I'm not mistaken. And then um, Sun and Tobian are the official languages of the state of Tobi and Sun respectively. So the state of Sun is um, is uh, um, further south towards uh, Papua New Guinea, and it includes the islands of uh, Fana, Puloana, and Merir. And then the state of Tobi is uh, Tobi Island and uh, Helen Island, or uh, otherwise known as Helen Reef. Um, so the languages, um, there are actually one, two, three, four, five varieties, <laughs> which are actually uh, mutually intelligible. Um, from speakers' intuitions, the differences are mainly phonological uh, and um, uh, primarily in terms of intonation. So the intonation is different. Um, some uh, consonants are also different. Some vowels are also different. Um, there aren't really many descriptions of the languages, so we still have a lot of uh, work uh, ahead of us. Mm, my motivations in doing this, um, um, in getting involved in language revitalization work, um, are primarily um, uh, professional in the sense that I um, I wanted to find other ways for my skills to be useful to people. Um, and I think um, I thought that uh, this was a, a good chance um, to empower people and uh, uh, build capacity in the various uh, various forms, um, whether that is technical skills or communication skills or language teaching. Um, 
and that's why I got involved. Um, um, I think, Julia, I'll talk about some activities I'm involved in, and then I will, I will ask you to talk to us about some activities that you have participated in. So, um, well, my involvement so far has been uh, indirect um, and primarily online. I, I primarily function as a, as a linguistics consultant for the youth uh, organization um, of uh, Sonsorol Youth. Uh, which is the the young historians of Sonsoro. Uh, we um, uh, we put together a um, uh, an orthography project, and we're hoping that it's a community created orthography. Um, and I've uh, worked closely um, with uh, Chelsea Pedro, who is a, a local uh, linguist. She studied linguistics at the University of Hawaii. Uh, we we um, worked very closely together. Um, my role in this activity was primarily, um, again, as a consultant, I, I provided some PowerPoint slides where I tried to explain um, phonological analysis uh, in um, a non-specialist language, uh, kind of like to make it, uh, to teach linguistics uh, to people who have no idea about linguistics, um, while at the same time making analysis of their language more um, like closer to them. Um, and um, I, I wasn't able to attend this event even virtually because uh, this, uh, this event uh, happened um, in, in Koror, in Palau. I left most of the planning uh, to the team members there, uh, because um, I thought that uh, this would this would be better since they knew who would be most interested in this. They knew which space would be most appropriate to do this. Um, they also knew um, how to attract people. So they were the ones in charge of promoting the event, uh, inviting people, uh, also structuring the sessions. Um, uh, what I what I really liked was that um, even though I gave them PowerPoint slides with the explanation with the explanations that I tried my best to do, um, they they revised them and they they've added language games and activities that they thought would be fun to include. Um, and I think this is something that I would not uh, do myself because of course um, I'm, I'm not an insider, but at the same time, I tried to contribute as much as I could. And it was also great practice uh, to watch the video of the session afterwards and uh, 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 practice being an, a, a, an observer. Um, so yeah, some challenges that, that I've had, I think uh, we've all had this, uh, which has been COVID. Um, and for me, primarily physical physical distance, the fact that I wasn't able to go there for um, for these events, um, it, it has also impacted um, building trust uh, between me and uh, the, the community in the sense that um, there are times when uh, we all have time to work on the project and there are others when people are busy with life. Um, um, and that is, they might have to go to wedding ceremonies or uh, they might have to actually go to work. And time difference has also been a great factor, uh, a great challenge in this, uh, being, I think, six hours ahead. <laughs> um, and finally, I think the hardest thing was uh, uh, positioning myself in this. Um, what is my role in, in these product, projects? Um, how do I navigate mm, my, my dual role as an educator and a linguist? Um, what can I offer uh, and what do I gain from this? Um, these are all questions that, I, that I've uh, I'm, I'm trying to answer myself every time uh, I do, I contribute any type of uh, uh, knowledge to this type of projects. Yes, so Julia, would you like to share your experience with us as well? Yeah, 
Uh, thank you, Vasiliki. Uh, um, and and you can we can, you can see there, there are lots of things that I mean, for example, three of us have experience in language teaching, for example, backgrounds in that. So, and and I think actually that's really useful in when it comes to language revitalization. And a lot of uh, more like formal linguists uh, don't don't have that background. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the things um, that I, I what I've one of the things one of the bits of research I've done as I spent some time with with a colleague in, in Guernsey, Jan Marquis, we got some money from the British Academy to look into the needs and the aspirations of learners of Genesee, of new speakers. Uh, what did what did they want to be and what did they what what challenges did they perceive? Um, and one of the main things that came out was people really wanted more opportunity to practice to, to have access to later speakers. Um, even though many of the learners are aged by 40 to 60, um, they don't seem to be able to make contact with native speakers much, and native speakers don't seem to be aware of of the, the learners. Um, some native speakers express surprise that anyone would want to learn the language. And because it's always been seen as, as so kind of unimportant and undesirable. Um, but I mean, I, I do think that attitudes are, are getting more positive. Um, and this is one of, one of the big findings of my PhD research um, that, you know, su actually surprising a number of people were interested. Um, this was some time ago, so it would be interesting to revisit that. Um, but so one of, one of the activities, again, like me, this is not one that I organized. I just sort of um, kind of uh, go along and, 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 and um, I both participate and I observe, um, but in a way I can, um, and this, this is actually the photo on the right is me outside one of these sessions. They call it speed patois. It's a long, patois is a kind of, kind of derogatory French term for a dialect, but when I was young, that was just what we thought the language was called. We didn't know of any negative ad, ad, um, kind of the connotations of that term in French, because we don't speak French um, in, in Guernsey. It's English is the language that we've been shifting to, although French was the like, high language, the education language in the past before the end of the 19th century. And um, so um, you can see that, the, that um, people meet together in pubs, in cafes, in, in, in uh, any kind of public hall that is, um, so you can see various places here. Um, so actually, the one that put the photo in the bottom right hand corner was actually used as a publicity shot for, for these activities. I was quite surprised I actually found this on the Internet. Oh, there's me <laughs> wearing my Genesee <laughs> T-shirt, um, which means come come to the West show. It was held in a sort of church hall near, near this agricultural show and people came along. Um, and the, the, a lot of the, there are a whole mixture of people. Some of them are older native speakers, but they real fluent native speakers are now in their 80s and 90s, and many of them don't get out much anymore. So you often get what we, um, well, some linguists call semi-speakers, I prefer to call latent speakers. Um, people who heard the language when they were young often didn't get the opportunity to develop full fluency. And these are very, kind of, I think, often very active and important um, kind of link people in language revitalization because they they have a good idea of the phonology and they also have a kind of a, the, uh, an idea of the uh, the how the language works um quite different to the how what people who are coming at the language from a, a total kind of um not knowing anything about it at all um different challenges and different perceptions and there are disadvantages because they often don't really want to hear anything that they didn't don't remember from their youth um, and it, to an extent, I'm kind of one of those because I heard it a bit, but not so much as many people. Um, and I find it really interesting to talk in, in these sessions. What you often find is that people take about half an hour to get in the bath, so to speak, and to, to warm up. And, and suddenly you find that they're speaking much more fluently than they were uh, right at the beginning of the session. You also get the confidence, you know, and, and it's a very warm. Uh, uh, what, what, what is impressive is it's, it's a really warm um environment and people are very supportive uh, much more than even, even you know um total newbies for, are really surprised at how 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 welcoming the environment is in, in all of these sessions if you just want to go on to the next slide um mm -hmm. i've also done a fair amount of language of uh, uh, documentation um my, 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 my phd research was not on documentation it wasn't linguistic as such it was actually more on attitudes towards the language um, and then I realized that, the, that there was much more documentation needed. Um, 
And this a gentleman on the right is called Herbie Nichols, and unfortunately he died the year before last. Um, a lovely man, and um, so we we made videos of him. He was an old fisherman who knew a lot a lot about fish, a lot about uh, cooking fish, but things like a good recipe to eat if you're ill, um, for example, very easy to digest. Um, and he makes crab pots and 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 other fish fish traps. Um, so this is one that he made for us, and this is actually a model one. And if you, if you can see carefully, it's got um, I don't know if you see my arrow here, little bit of green ribbon at the bottom. Um, and yeah, this is kind of, yeah, this is a kind of model of, of a fish of, 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 a, of a crab of a crab pot, which is actually given to people for wedding presents. Um, so this is a, a very traditional activity, and he and he made this for me. He gave it to me, and this is me going, oh wow, this is yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> and I've actually got it in my office back at SOAS, so maybe you might have seen it. <laughs> So, and, and this is totally different, just to show that I don't just work in Guernsey. I've, I've been to lots of other places. So this is me talking, obviously, pre-COVID. Um, actually, it was about nine years ago now that I visited New Caledonia um, with, uh, um, with the help and support of Aurélie Cochard, who was doing PhD research there. And we met through um, um, just being interested be through, through a conference at SOAS, actually. Um, and uh, these are various people involved in, in language revitalization, language documentation in, in New Caledonia. Um, for, uh, they all speakers of a language called Church in, in the, north, uh, the northeast of the island. Um, and then this is a guy who used to be the mayor of the, of the village, um, De Marie Pijo, and he's uh, showing me on the map where we are and, 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 all the, and, and the language situation. And the lady on the left is called Scholastique, and she's a member of the Language Academy, the Kanak Language Academy. Um, and she's trying to standardize and, and, and create orthographies for, for many of the, of the uh, indigenous languages in New Caledonia. Um, and then okay. I feel that if we if we continue, we will we will never stop, and yeah, we, we, so we we're going to run out of time. Yep, let's stop. Yes, we only have ten minutes left. So if you if you don't mind, uh, um, I'll go to the questions. Oh, there is there is one for Mijo, I think, but um, I can't read this, um, or I can try. I. <laughs> a mistake. I already answered uh, there. I thought we, we will run out of time. So okay. that means thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe yeah. there were, it, maybe oh. we can just um, summarize the question. Yeah, feel free to, to discuss it live. Uh, the chat won't show up in the recording. So if you want folks uh -huh. to hear the question later, please feel free to do it verbally. In, in the Lucas, um Ryukyu Islands are divided into two prefectures by Japanese government. And mm. Sophia, sorry if I don't read your name properly. Sophia, Sophia. Mm. Um, she asked me about um Shuma, about Shumakutuba Center, which is a language um language planning uh, official language planning office in uh, uh, in Okinawa Prefecture. Um, our islands are divided into two prefectures, so. Only that prefecture has a language promotion center. The other prefectures are neglected completely. That is uh, one issue. She, she was asking me if, uh, if they also incorporate what I am doing. And there are two questions. That was the first question. Then I replied, unfortunately, um, they have resources, but they don't have uh, much knowledge in language revitalization. Uh, as Julia um, uh, introduced about us about uh, about her community situation, they don't have knowledge. You know, um, I mean, they don't know about. Uh, uh, but so, so I think we we need to. Uh, there are many uh, communities who work on language revitalization, so we we should share our knowledge. Then they really need um, uh, advice, but they don't have anyone to turn to, unfortunately. So. I really want to help them in the future. And we had we had 10 years of active language <laughs> revitalization effort in the Lucas, but they are not aligned each other. Some, some of them are conflicting each other. So we have uh, not so much has changed in the last 10 years, unfortunately. 
what I believe is we should reframe the whole language revitalization efforts from the perspective of new speakers because uh, new speakers are the next generation. Then another question was that, uh, although Ainu people were recognized by the Japanese government, we Rikiwan people are not recognized by the government. Then she was asking me uh, what I think about it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not reading. Then what I replied was, Currently, I and other Rikiwan people, especially young people in 20s and 30s, we were trying to we are trying to align with the United Nations to claim our indigenous uh, rights. Yes, thank you, Miho. I guess um, this problem of which language gets to get the funding or gets the promotion of you know, support um, is is prevalent in other areas that have yeah. multiple languages that need mm. attention. So my region is the same and wherever Waki is spoken is the same. So in Pakistan where it is spoken, it, you know, other languages in the region also need support. None of them are taught. None of them are taught in, uh, in the schools. And um, if the government's chooses to support one, then the other ethnic community will ask, why not us? Why this one? And why do our children have to learn China? Why can they not choose? So I guess uh, it needs a whole setup, of course, with planning and policy, and uh, hopefully <laughs> academics, insiders, outsiders, uh, people who, who work in the field can, can, can pave way, you know? In, in our own respective regions. So I, I guess that uh, that's direly needed. I have a question actually, while we wait for other folks to drop their questions in. Uh, so for the Wahi speakers in diaspora in Russia, are they mostly coming from Tajikistan or are there Wahi speakers from other countries as well? And is there any conflict between the varieties or the orthographies? in language maintenance activities in Russia? So like I said, because they were sort of a colony or like part of the Soviet Union, so they know Russian. So it's easier for them to uh, make the transition from Tajikistan into Russia. Uh, most of them, 99% of the Waki speakers are from Tajikistan. So if a, um, a person from China goes there, which seems very unlikely. Xinjiang has its own, its own problems. Same with Afghanistan, because the Waki speakers in Afghanistan live in a very remote part of Afghanistan. I have personally known two Waki students who went to Russia. Uh, one has already returned to Pakistan, and another one is uh, living in Russia. And interestingly, he has... Um, <laughs> reinvented himself as a Tajik Waki. So he's like, we shouldn't be. <laughs> he has improved his Waki because he used to use a lot of uh, English and Urdu when he spoke Waki. And now he, I guess uh, that's another debate uh, whether we should be borrowing from Farsi, like Tajiki or, you know, other languages. And uh, I hear stories about him. I have seen some videos of him speaking about how, you know, we should be preserving Wahi. So one person at least, and uh, there's no conflict. He seems to be very happy being among the Tajiki Wahi speakers. Um, so yeah, most of them are Tajikis. And there's another question for you from uh, Sophia. Is there any project um, that is working on a new standardized orthography? Um, like I said, in each country, um, they're trying their best. Um, so um, I spoke to a Waki person from China and he mentioned that they use the Chinese characters. And actually in Xinjiang, they used to be taught Uyghur language, which, is, which has an Arabic script. So they use whatever is available to them with what they know. Um, so in Tajikistan, they use Cyrillic, and in Pakistan, people have experimented both with the Persian and the Roman script. And it's not standardized. People are still working um, IPA, 
there's uh, people in Pakistan who used IPA to, to write Wahi and actually published a book of poetry in IPA transcription. So, <laughs> because it, it gets all the sounds. So different types of projects, but not for Wahi people all around the world. It's so far like for different regions. That's very interesting. It, it sounds very fun to write uh, poetry using the IPA. Yeah, yeah. so so unpoetic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, how could you set his hand up? And um, yes, yeah, someone else had a had a question. Oh, um, I, I see one from Anna in the chat, but uh, if Hercules already had his hand up, uh, please go ahead. Um, would you? Oh yeah, they can't, they can't speak to us. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, so write, Hercules. Write question. <laughs> yes, Hercules. I oh, know it says no. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so Anna says in Palau, what are some of the most common attitudes towards language maintenance and towards having outsiders work in language revitalization? Okay, that's a that's a very good question. Thank you for the question. Um, so the fact that uh, Sunshalese is the official language of the state, um, there are mixed attitudes towards that because there are uh, three other varieties. In, in the state. So sometimes it is felt that Sonsorilis attracts more attention because there are also, um, this, the population is also a little bit higher. Um, but because most most of the population has moved from the, the Southwest Islands to the main islands of Palau um, for again, economic reasons and also um, e ecological reasons like typhoons and things like that. Um, there's a lot of uh, mixing. So there are families where um, one of the parents might speak uh, uh, the variety from uh, Merir and then the other one might speak the variety from Sonsorol. So um, um, it's, um, it's a strange situation and I don't really have any <laughs> uh, conclusive uh, remarks about this, but um, I think the attitudes are mixed. Um, uh, now, the the main issue is that they they're more interested in uh, development projects and how, in the sense that how can a uh, language be used for um, community development and for acquiring um, more rights and resources in the wider um, setting of Palau. Um, so I think they are aligned towards that, but it's uh, the internal, sometimes internal conflicts that um, are kind of inhibiting the work. Um, the, the attitudes towards uh, having outsiders work in language revitalization, um, they, they have had experiences with outsider linguists. And uh, there is another um, linguist from SIL who is uh, working with, um, um, with uh, members of the community in translating the Bible. Um, they, from the survey that we recently conducted, um, it felt that they, they welcome um, linguists, but in the form of um, consultants rather than the ones actually making the decisions. They, they want to make the decisions themselves. And I, I think that makes sense. Um, if it was me as well, I would, I would like to make the decision myself for my language. But um, they also, they've also told me that they recognize that um, they need an expert's insight. Um, and um, I, I mean, I'm not an expert yet, <laughs> but uh, still uh, working with, uh, with Chelsea, um, I think that that's uh, what's been um, the most welcoming thing about uh, our project is the fact that it's not just me, but the fact that I'm also working and mentoring someone in the community um, to do language work. So. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I think we are nearly out of time, but before we go, I wanted to ask if each of you uh, had a brief statement of advice or encouragement for folks around the world who may be just getting started in language revitalization work? It's a big question. 
Julia, would you like to go first? I thought you or, might say that. <laughs> um, should, maybe we should leave you for, for last since you, you are the one who has <laughs> the you. most experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, who wants to go first then? I guess um, I, I'll go first. <laughs> Um, if people have realized and have chosen revitalization, it already means that, you know, they have um, realized that this, this is important. So well done for that. And um, um, there might be times when you get frustrated, like I couldn't find a lot of literature on Waki. So I really had to look and, you know, um, but with the internet, you can, you can, um, you can use other medium, uh, you do, you do other mediums. Um, it can be text, it can be videos, it can be audio files, all of those to your advantages. Uh, and um, don't give up and um, yeah, slow and steady will do it. Yes, I think I think that's great advice and, and I'll agree. I think patience is the most important thing in, um, in doing any type of revitalization work. Um, patience in learning the language, if you're learning the language, patience in working with people um, and being an external researcher. I think, I think what's also very important is to provide opportunities and share the resources that, that you have, that you have access to, um, but also listen uh, and, uh, uh, like I think listening is also very important. Listen to what people want to do, um, how you can help, um, listen to their advice and also offer advice if possible. Yeah. I think I share, what I think um, as it is often said, languages are not endangered, but speakers of that language, uh, language is marginalized. So we have to, um, we, ha um, we have to respect relational accountability. I mean, um, we, we need to understand uh, how, um, sorry, uh, let, let me say in different way. I think uh, any one of us has, have um, a marginalized aspect and dominant aspect. I think it's very important to explore both sides of ourselves. So, uh, so for instance, I am from the most dominant part in Ryukyu Islands. And before I started PhD research, I was always victimizing myself saying, oh, I am a marginalized indigenous person in Japan. But actually when I started uh, field work, when I interviewed uh, Ryukyuan people from other small islands, I was actually dominating them without knowing. I had unconscious bias. So I learned I actually can be dominant person. And then, so this unconscious bias is really strong. When I uh, work with Japanese researchers, uh, they are doing things with uh, good motivations, but they don't realize how it can be, um, how, Sometimes they impose uh, assimilation, assimilative pressure on us, <laughs> which is com uh, controversial in language revitalization. So, what I learned from uh, this um, um, field work is to to explore both sides of myself, being dominant, being marginalized. By learning both sides of ourselves, when we, um, I think, we have, uh, we can. Imagine how other person are feeling. You know, I think it, it helped us to listen to other people more actively. That is my advice or what I learned. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I, you. I, I, I think you're right. It's, it's a massive personal journey. Um, it's, it's really, really rewarding. It can also be very, very frustrating. Um, um, you know, there, there, there are lots of possible uh, obstacles that we can find, uh, um, all sorts of obstacles from, from financial to personal. To, um, um, also, uh, um, 
uh, ideological uh, uh, um, disagreements within the community, as uh, lots of people have been saying. Um, but it, it is also massively rewarding. Um, and it's um, Vasiliki talked a little bit about development. Um, and, and Miho talked about identity, finding your identity. Um, and all of those things come into play. I think, you know, in, in terms of, um, and, and people I know in New Zealand have been looking at this more and more, the personal revitalization aspect. I've certainly um, found that myself. I, I, when uh, people, students used to say to me, well, what, what's the point of doing this? Well, they have actually the warm feeling you get in your stomach, really. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it is personally revitalizing and that, and that can only be good. For, for confidence, self-confidence of people in, in, in marginalized situations. So, yeah, it's, but it is also hard. So it is also really important to persevere, but I, I really think it's worth it. Um, and as Miho said, looking to the future is the really important thing to do. Thank you. Julia, there's actually a question for you. <laughs> would, you would you like to, to answer? Do you have time? Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, as you said. Uh, um, so the question is from Amanda Holmes. It says uh, about the latent speakers generation. A generation is often neglected, even though a key generation is a link. So what are the particular challenges a generation faces? Okay. What are some of the ways to intentionally bring this generation into the revitalization efforts? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, well, very briefly. Um, yeah. I. A kind of writing something about it at the moment, or well, have recently, but it's not published yet. Um, uh, uh, there is a group called, they call themselves the Rememberers in Guernsey, and they're kind of informal group. Um, they meet once a week or so um, at a cafe or, or someone's homes, I think actually twice a week or whenever they can, basically. But what impressed me was that they, they, they are the only people I know who are really interested in increasing their fluency. Um, to, to think of, uh, in, in order to converse and, and uh, um, overtly basically having enjoyment as, as, as a motivation, uh, which I think is really, really important. Um, yeah, um, I said that there are pros and cons. Um, I, I think it has to be uh, that the, 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 the common says the rememberers because that's what they're doing. And some of them aren't really so interested in learning any, any, any new things about the language. Um, and I think uh, the remembering needs to be tempered with language documentation, because when we make recordings of people, sometimes we play them back to them and they're really surprised, oh, that wasn't me, I don't talk like that. People often have much more purist notions of how language is. Um, we find this when we do a dissertation in language documentation too. Um, particularly if you have a diagnostic situation, that means in, in Guernsey in the past, uh, French was the high language, the language of, language of education, the language of writing. So Genesier wasn't written. And Genesier was like the language people talk in the greenhouses, um, uh, but also a lang the language of pride and identity. Um, um, where am I going with this? Um, so um, people often if um, still have this idea that French is the correct way to write and, and, and to speak. And often if, if they know French, um, and they can't think of a word or, or, or even a grammar point, they will fall back on French. Um, and I think we, we see this in a lot of places. I've seen it a lot with uh, uh, um, uh, any, any time we do a, a, like a, um, a field methods course and, and, and we get speakers, you often get, you often see this, pe people falling back on the dominant language or the high language. Um, so I think it's really important to, to look at uh, what's actually happening as well as what you think is happening um, and you can do that through through observation as as as, as well if, if you're an external linguist and I think this is another way that we have we have a role to play is as, as Apostoliki said to help in in the linguistic side of, of language documentation thank you well, if there are, if there aren't any other questions, I think we can we can end the session here. Thank you everybody for attending. Um, I hope uh, it was uh, informative. Um, if you if you have any questions or if you would like to know anything about our projects, um, please feel free to contact us. Um, I think uh, Anna has uh, our emails. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, you have my, my permission to share my email, Anna. So. Thank you. 
And I want to say a oh, perfect. And I want to say a big, big thanks uh, on behalf of Amanda and myself and ELP. Uh, thank you to all of you so much for being here to share your experiences and your work today. I, I can say this was a smorgasbord of learning. I have a lot to think about. I think we all do. Uh, and so thank you. This was a really wonderful session. And it was, I love this panel format. It's nice to have a conversation. Uh, just a few notes for attendees. This is the final session of the first half of the festival. So keep in mind that you will have to use a new link to join the talks from tomorrow onwards. Uh, you will be getting a survey at the end of today, just asking about how the first half went for you, if we can improve anything for the second half. If you want to fill that out, that will be a big, big help to us. It will come to your email. Uh, and if you have, again, questions for the panelists, uh, I will make their emails available to you if you want to write to us. Uh, and thank you again. This was a fantastic panel. I really enjoyed it. I think we all did. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. Yes, thank you. Lovely to talk thank to you, you so much. Beautiful. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, that, have that, a that, good Hanita, evening. Has just shared a link to, to the video that she got those stills from, from the Nauru's celebration. Beautiful. Thank you, Nahida. I will, I will also put that uh, in the WhatsApp group for the festival if anybody wants yeah. to find it later. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay, good Take night. care. Good Be morning. well. <laughs> Bye.